good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Hill, and uh, I'm the director of the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies here at King's College London, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our second face-to-face -face, uh, event since the um, sort of end of the pandemic. Um, <laughs> it um, really is nice to be able to get into a room with a, with a live audience rather than do everything online. Um, and I'm very delighted to, to welcome Dr. Catherine Harvey, who is going to um, present her, her, her book, uh, A Self-Fulfilling Prophecy, The Saudi Struggle for Iraq. Um, Kitty is a former student of King's. Uh, she was here a few years ago, uh, mm -hmm. completing her PhD in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies, um, and is now teaching on the Security Studies Programme at uh, Georgetown University and also has links to Johns Hopkins yeah. as well, uh, for teaching there. So it's wonderful to have her back, um, to have a former student back to, to talk to us about her work, which she's continuing to, to work on uh, today as well. Um, Kitty's going to be able to speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll open the floor up to uh, questions uh, from, from you guys. So, so please uh, don't feel, uh, do, do, do uh, get involved. Um, for your information, the event is being recorded at the back, and that's one of the reasons for the slightly strange setup, so that the camera can get my best side, um, uh, and not the, not the chairs. Um, and we will put a copy of the recording on the, the YouTube channel that's linked to the War City Department, I think, but it will be available uh, through our website. So if you would like to re-watch it or to, to share it with anybody else, uh, that is where it will be. Um, Hearst, Kitty's publisher, um, have also kindly sent one of their uh, representatives, Ramin, Ramin, Raminta, uh, sorry, at the back, um, who has got uh, copies of the book available at a special discounted rate. You get just over 25% off. Um, Mothering Sunday is very close. Um, you know, flowers are obvious. Get, get them a book about, uh, about Saudi Arabia and Iraq instead. Um, uh, also, at the end, we're going to have a drinks reception, which will be set up at the back there. Um, that's free and open to anybody, so do please uh, stay for that for, for a, a glass of wine or, or something else and to, uh, to take a look at a copy of it, uh, Kitty's book. Um, finally, if you're interested in the Middle East and North Africa generally, uh, please do keep an eye on the Institute's website and on our Twitter feeds. Uh, we try to organise one event a month during the course of the academic year. We'll hopefully have something for, for May. So keep an eye on that. Like this event. It's free. It's open to all. So, so just come along uh, if, it, if it tickles your fancy. Um, Kitty, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I'm clearly going to stand. Uh, and thank you all for I, for coming this evening. I know I have some pretty stiff competition, meaning the lovely <laughs> London evening, um, but I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are PhD students or at least postgraduate students. Uh, the uh, you know I sometimes thought that my PhD was never going to end, <laughs> but I can tell you that eventually it does, uh, and it's very cool for me to be now on this side of the podium presenting my research um, as a published book. And I would just like to thank uh, John for organizing this event to the um, Institute for helping with the logistics. And I'd also just really like to thank, he couldn't be here this evening, but my supervisor, Mike Farquhar. I'm, I'm really very confident that I would not be here presenting this research if it were not for Mike. So I remain very thankful to him. Um, and without further ado, <coughs> My book is about relations between Saudi Arabia and Iraq in the years after the 2003 invasion of Iraq. When I started my PhD, now some years ago, my focus wasn't actually on Iraq, and I have to admit that I didn't really know that much about it. I was originally asking a different research question. I was interested in exploring the responses of the Sunni Arab states, primarily Saudi Arabia, but not exclusively Saudi Arabia, to Iran's rising regional influence in the years before the Arab Spring. At that time, I took it for granted that a predominantly Shia state, such as Iraq, would naturally align itself with its Shia neighbor, Iran. 
But what I found as I really began my research was that a few years after the invasion, 2006, 2007, 2008, what I found was that a range of Iraqi leaders, Sunni Shia and Kurdish, were in fact reaching out to the Saudis in an effort to engage. Their efforts were documented in news reporting from the period, and they were saying things like, we want better relations with the Arab world, and we want better relations in particular with Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia is our gateway back into the Arab world. Meanwhile, the Saudis were appearing to be really standoffish. They were making no ostensible effort to reciprocate the Iraqi outreach. And this not only surprised me, it was also very confusing to me. If the Saudis were deeply concerned about Iranian influence in Iraq by this point, which I knew they were, why were they making no, no effort to reciprocate the Iraqi outreach, which surely would have offered them a way to curtail Iranian influence in Iraq? Meanwhile, in contrast to Saudi Arabia, by about 2008, most of Iraq's other Arab neighbors were beginning to engage with Iraq in meaningful ways. And this only reinforced for me how confusing the Saudi case was. Over the course of a number of weeks, I really became more and more perplexed until one day I realized that I was asking the wrong research question. I had been asking what the Saudis were doing to curtail Iranian influence in Iraq, and from that point of departure, it made no sense why the Saudis were refusing to engage with the Iraqis. A better question I came to realize was how did the Saudis respond to Iraq's post-2003 Shia ascendance? And that question began to unlock for me the puzzle of why the Saudis were refusing to engage. And it also began to reveal the impact that the Saudi refusal to engage ultimately had on Iraq. So with that introduction, I want to make three main points in this talk. First, it's my principal argument in my book, as well as with you all this evening, that Iraq's alignment with Iran after the 2003 invasion was not a foregone conclusion. That Iraq did in fact end up in a regional alignment with Iran was the result, I argue, of a self-fulfilling prophecy created by the Saudis, and one created in particular by the late King Abdullah, who was principally responsible for the Saudi, Saudi decision not to engage with Iraq. I argue that Abdullah's decision not to engage was ultimately self-defeating, but to be fair to Abdullah, he had pleaded with the Americans not to invade Iraq. But if the Americans were going to invade, the Saudis made fairly clear to the Americans what they wanted to have happen, which in essence means that they wanted the Americans to preserve a Sunni-dominated regime in Baghdad, which, could, could, which would continue to act as a counterweight or a bulwark against Iran. The Americans flouted the Saudi advice and the Saudis' interests, so to be fair to Abdullah, it's not a surprise that he was exceedingly unenthusiastic about engaging with the new Shia-led Iraq. And this is my second point. This story reveals yet another unintended consequence of the invasion of Iraq, and one that hasn't really previously been explored in the literature. And that's that the Americans midwifed a new order in Baghdad to which their closest ally in the Arab world, Saudi Arabia, was fundamentally opposed. My third point is providing a comparison of the Saudi case to that of some of Iraq's other Arab neighbors. The most interesting comparison is with Jordan. In the year or two after the invasion, Jordanian leaders were also deeply anxious about Iraq's Shia ascendance. But their priority was to maintain a close relationship with Iraq, no matter what, and they quickly decided to embrace Iraq's new Shia leaders. It was a very different approach from that of Saudi Arabia. Beyond Jordan, a number of other Arab states, most notably the UAE, were also engaging with Baghdad 
by 2008. The leaders from these other Arab states exhibited a greater degree of flexibility and open-mindedness with regard to the new Iraq than did Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. So my first point is that Iraq's alignment with Iran after 2003 was not a foregone conclusion. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Before I proceed, it might be useful for me to explain what exactly I mean by self-fulfilling prophecy. The eminent 20th century sociologist, Robert Merton, formulated this concept, and he defined it as a false definition of the situation evoking a new behavior which makes the originally false conception come true. Furthermore, it has become a core argument in social psychology that inaccurate social stereotypes often become self-fulfilling prophecies through human interaction. Experiments in social psychology dating back to the 1970s have demonstrated how perceivers who treat targets, that is, human targets, in line with an inaccurate stereotype of the target's social group, often elicit a change in the target's behavior that is consistent with the stereotype. In fact, Merton, in his formulation of the concept, provided an example of an inaccurate social stereotype coming to fruition on a large scale. Merton observed that in early 20th century America, African Americans were typically barred from joining labor unions because white union members perceived them to be strike breakers. But Merton pointed out that African Americans, having few job opportunities, often took any work they could. Thus, rather than being strike breakers because they wanted to be, African Amer Americans often broke strikes because their exclusion from labor unions forced them to be a self-fulfilling prophecy had taken place. White Americans held a stereotypic image of their African-American counterparts, but African-Americans only conformed to this image because they were treated as such. Merton further pointed out that once African-Americans were permitted to join unions, they stopped being strike breakers in large numbers. With regard to Saudi Arabia and Iraq, I argue that deeply ingrained beliefs about Iran and the Arab Shia account for the Saudis' decision not to engage with Iraq. The first is a set of beliefs that Iran is inherently expansionist, that Iran is always intent on expanding in the region, as well as that Iran bears malign intent towards Saudi Arabia. And in the book, I explore these Saudi beliefs in detail. The other set of beliefs that accounts for the Saudis' decision not to engage with Iraq is a belief that attributes Arab Shia loyalty to Iran. This, of course, is a stereotypical, stereotypical image of the Arab Shia that is fairly common among Arab Sunnis. In my research, again detailed more extensively in the book, it becomes clear that Saudi leaders often simply assumed that Arab Shia figures were aligned with Iran if not outright controlled by Iran. Saudi leaders did not spend much time thinking or reflecting about how Arab Shia figures were actors in their own right and often had interests that diverged from those of Iran. My argument is that these beliefs predisposed Saudi leaders, and in particular the late King Abdullah, who was then the ultimate foreign policy decision maker in the Saudi system, to perceiving that the Shia leaders who came to power in Iraq after the invasion were beholden to Iran, and that Iran was therefore taking over the country. In particular, King Abdullah came to regard Nuri al-Maliki, who became prime minister of Iraq in 2006, as basically an Iranian stooge. Abdullah also believed that Maliki had lied to him and I will only say here that that was a very murky contention that I explore in greater detail in, in detail in the book. But in any case, Abdullah, 
believing that Maliki was loyal to Iran, refused to engage with Maliki or have anything to do with his government through the time that Maliki was ousted from power in the summer of 2014, which was a few short months before Abdullah himself passed away. So now we come to the self-fulfilling prophecy part. A widespread belief has taken root that Maliki, as prime minister, was beholden to Iran and that he had always been beholden to Iran. But that's not actually what my research bore out. <clears throat> what I discovered in my research was that Maliki had long taken a more skeptical view of Iran. He had indeed been based in Iran during the 1980s to fight Saddam Hussein's regime, but his time in Iran had actually left him embittered toward the Islamic Republic, which repressed and manipulated the Dawa party, the Iraqi Shia Islamist party of which Maliki was a member. At the end of the Iran-Iraq war, Maliki relocated to Damascus, where he continued his fight against the Ba'athists. Upon his return to Iraq in 2003, Maliki earned for himself a very sectarian reputation as someone who is seeking to dismantle Saddam Hussein's regime, root and branch. But regardless of his sectarian reputation, he wasn't actually looking for Iraq to become beholden to Iran. Indeed, my research bore out that Maliki really was, and still today sees himself, as an Iraqi nationalist. He was not looking for a bad relationship with Iran. He wanted a positive relationship with the Islamic Republic. But he saw Iraq as an independent and Arab state and he wanted it to be reintegrated into the Arab world. It is not my purpose tonight to defend Maliki. As prime minister, he was authoritarian. He was not somebody who was interested in sharing power. And at times he also took very sectarian positions. I do not dispute that. What my argument is, is that the image of Maliki as an Iranian client is basically incorrect. Moreover, in his first government, Maliki took actions that demonstrated his desire to reintegrate Iraq into the Arab world and to remain independent of Iran. In fact, Maliki's first trip abroad as prime minister was to Saudi Arabia. At the time, the Americans were pushing Maliki to reach out to the Saudis but I believe that Maliki himself made the decision to travel to Saudi Arabia as his first trip abroad because he believed that this trip would be beneficial for Iraq. Maliki also took a notable action in 2008 that demonstrated his independence from Iran. That spring, Maliki initiated Operation Charge of the Knights which targeted militias that were loosely affiliated with Muqtada al-Sadr. At the time, these Sadrist militias were Iran's principal proxy in Iraq, and Charge of the Knights significantly reduced their effectiveness. Charge of the Knights won significant praise from many quarters in Iraq, including from Sunni Arabs. Indeed, Iraq's then most senior Sunni Arab politician, Vice President Tariq al-Hashami, a man who in fact had, had a long-running feud with Maliki, called Maliki's decision to take on the Sudrist militias historic. And al-Hashami declared that, Mal that Maliki's government had taken a, quote, unexpected huge stride in the right direction. Maliki's independence from Iran was most evident in the lead up to Iraq's 2010 parliamentary elections. Prior to those elections, Maliki campaigned on a nationalist pat platform. He called for an Iraq that was sovereign and strong and an Iraqi people who lived proud and free. And he resisted pressure to join an Iranian-backed coalition composed of Shia Islamist parties. Instead, Maliki reached out to members of Iraq's Sunni Arab and Kurdish communities to form a cross-sectarian coalition and in, private, and in private conversations with the Americans, he explained his thinking. 
he told the Americans that the formation of sectarian alliances backed by outside powers such as Iran would be, quote, disastrous for Iraq, turning Iraq into effectively another Lebanon. These conversations are recorded in U.S. diplomatic cables that have been released by WikiLeaks. Nevertheless, what is most remembered about the 2010 elections is that in the aftermath of those elections, Maliki came together with Iran to maintain his hold on power. Indeed, Maliki exhibited a remarkable change in behavior at this time, going from resisting pressure to align himself with Iran prior to the elections to seeking out Iranian support afterwards. And Maliki's relationship with Iran only became increasingly close in his second government. So what had happened? I argue that what accounts for Maliki's change in behavior was the threat he perceived from Saudi Arabia. As early as 2007, Maliki was voicing concern to the Americans that the Saudis wanted him removed from power. Moreover, my research bears out that Maliki's belief was basically correct. It seems that the Saudis did in fact want Maliki removed. In particular, the late King Abdullah wanted Maliki to be replaced with Ayad Alawi, another Shia politician who had been prime minister of Iraq in 2004 and 2005. Alawi was a former Ba'athist, which gave Abdullah comfort that he was sufficiently anti-Iran. For the 2010 elections, the Saudis and other Sunni states, such as Turkey, supported an electoral co coalition led by Alawi. When Alawi's coalition won two more seats than Maliki's in those elections, that's when Maliki's behavior changed, and changed in a way that was consistent with the stereotypic view that Abdullah had of him. To repeat myself, a core argument in social psychology is that inaccurate social stereotypes can become self-fulfilling prophecies through human interaction. When perceivers treat targets in line with a stereotype of the target's social group, they often elicit a change in behavior on the part of targets that is consistent with the stereotype. In this case, Abdullah had refused to engage with Maliki because he believed, inaccurately, that Maliki was an Iranian agent. From 2007, Maliki began to feel threatened by the Saudis, but Maliki's sense of threat came to a new height with Alawi's success in the 2010 elections. There is no question that Maliki wanted to hold on to power at this time out of personal ambition. Still, more was going on here. Many Iraqi Shia, not just Maliki, interpreted the formation of Alawi's coalition as a Saudi-backed attempt to reverse Iraq's post-2003 Shia ascendance. Maliki in particular believed at this time that Saudi Arabia was trying to assert control over Iraq via Alawi. I argue that the need to prevent this scenario combined, of course, with Maliki's very real desire to hold on to power, was what compelled him to change course and align with Iran. In short, Abdullah refused to engage with Maliki because he believed Maliki was an Iranian agent. But it was Abdullah's refusal to engage with Maliki and his backing of Ayat Alawi that ultimately compelled Maliki to change his behavior at the time of the 2010 elections and to do so in a way that was consistent with Abdullah's stereotypic image of him. That's the self-fulfilling prophecy. And the self-fulfilling prophecy became all the more evident in Maliki's second government as he moved closer to Iran. I detail in the book that what drove his alignment with Iran in his second government was not some affinity he had for Iran, but the mounting threat he perceived from Saudi Arabia. So, 
I argue that the Saudis ultimately took a self-defeating decision that pushed Iraq toward Iran. But to be fair to them, their decision did not take place in a vacuum. It flowed from the decision taken by the George W. Bush administration to invade Iraq. It's not that the Saudis wanted Saddam Hussein to remain in power. They absolutely wanted Saddam removed, and they had worked to that end with the United States and other Arab countries in the years after the 1990 to 1991 Gulf War. Their preferred solution was a palace coup that would topple Saddam while leaving his Ba'athist regime in place. The point was to remove Saddam in such a way that was least disruptive to Iraq and that would also preserve Sunni Arab power in Baghdad so that Iraq could continue to act as a bulwark against Iran. And this was also basically the policy of the United States in the 1990s. The administrations of both Bush the father and Bill Clinton attempted to foment the desired coup in Baghdad while preserving Iraq as a counterweight to Iran. But of course, a successful coup did not materialize. And in its final years, the Clinton administration put toppling Saddam on the back burner. Dealing with Saddam was also not a significant priority in the first months of the George W. Bush administration until, of course, the attacks of September 11, 2001. It's not my intention tonight to, ex to explore why Bush decided to invade Iraq. What's important to point out, however, is that in very short order, US policy went from trying to topple Saddam via a coup to invading the country. And based on the neoconservative ideology that was embraced by many senior members of the Bush administration to establishing democracy in Baghdad. The Saudis, for their part, were thoroughly opposed to an invasion, which they believed correctly, would fracture the country and produce a power vacuum. They ultimately provided tacit support to the invasion, given their longstanding ties to the United States, but they, but they never thought that an invasion was anything other than a very bad idea. On the eve of the war, they were, they were making all sorts of efforts to entice Saddam to step down from power in a last ditch attempt to avert the coming war. Meanwhile, the Saudis were communicating to the Americans what they wanted to have happen in Iraq. As before, they wanted most of Saddam Hussein's regime to remain in place to preserve Iraq as a bulwark against Iran. Again, this had been their common objective with Bush the father and Bill Clinton. I believe the Saudis had no idea at this time that Bush the son intended instead to establish democracy in Baghdad. But the policy of Bush the son was indeed to establish democracy and thus Iraq's Shia majority was able to rise to power in post-invasion Iraq. I've already explained how the late King Abdullah struggled to see a Shia-led Iraq as anything other than basically an Iranian vassal state. I've also explained how the Iraqis reached out to Saudi Arabia to reintegrate the country back into the Arab fold, but this was also a significant priority for the United States in the years after 2003. The Americans sought to stabilize Iraq, which in part meant reintegrating, reintegrating it into the Arab world. And the Americans placed considerable pressure on their, their Arab allies, most especially Saudi Arabia, to accept the new government in Baghdad. Any number of senior Bush administration officials, including George W. Bush himself, weighed in with King Abdullah to push him to engage with Iraq. But Abdullah basically told the Americans, no. I argue that Abdullah's decision was self-defeating, but to be fair to him, he felt deeply burned by the United States. As he himself saw it, his ally had not only flouted Saudi interests, it had done something that was antithetical to Saudi interests. 
And basically, no amount of US pressure could compel him to accept something he regarded as basically incompatible with Saudi national security. As for the Americans, the important point is that the success of their Iraq project depended in part on the new Iraq being accepted by its Arab neighbors, particularly Saudi Arabia. But the Americans intervened in Iraq in such a way that they were never likely to garner Saudi support, at least not under Abdullah. This was a significant contradiction in US policy and one that undermined the Americans' efforts to stabilize Iraq for many years. My third point is actually sort of a plea for open-mindedness among policymakers. At the heart of my book lies a story about how a foreign policy decision maker, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, adhered to a mistaken belief, and by adhering to it, ended up turning some semblance of it into a reality. By contrast to Abdullah, many other Arab leaders exhibited more flexibility and open-mindedness, and took the more appropriate decision to engage with Iraq. The most interesting example comes from Jordan. In the two years after the invasion, Jordanian leaders exhibited all the same anxieties about a Shia-led Iraq as did the Saudis. In fact, Jordanian leaders were very, very vocal. They were publicly very vocal about their fears. On the eve of Iraq's first post-Saddam elections in January 2005, Jordan's then foreign minister, Hani al-Mulki, warned in the Arabic press that a, quote, religious Shi'i regime with a Persian flavor could emerge after the elections. And he warned that, a quote, it is in no one's interest to have an anti-Arab Persian Shi'i religious regime in Iraq. But in the following years, the Jordanians changed course almost entirely. Their primary objective at this time was to maintain the close economic relationship they had built with Iraq during the Saddam years. And thus, if Iraq was now under Shia leadership, the Jordanians knew they had to adapt. Thus, having apparently figured out that their pre-election rhetoric was only alienating Iraq's new leaders, a few months later, they were saying things like, the time has come for the Arab countries to open their hearts to Iraq, and a, quote, democratic Iraq would be a success for Jordan as much as it would be for the Iraqis. In 2008, King Abdullah of Jordan traveled to Baghdad, becoming the first Arab head of state to visit Iraq since the invasion. By this time, violence in Iraq was receding, and the Iraqis, backed by the Americans, had just completed Operation Charge of the Night to disarm the Shia militias. Indeed, as a Jordanian newspaper put it following Charge of the Nights, quote, now, after al-Maliki's government has taken such a courageous stand, Arabs must move quickly, dispatch their ambassadors to Baghdad, and reopen their embassies. The Arabs' continued distance will only serve the Iranians. The trip by Jordanian King Abdullah to Iraq came as many senior Arab officials were visiting Baghdad and reopening their embassies. In fact, the foreign minister of the UAE, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, made a particularly interesting and introspective comment at this time. While he was on a trip to Baghdad in the summer of 2008, Sheikh Abdullah stated at a press conference that, quote, we must be frank and say that the states of the region have taken a long time to understand the new Iraq. Iraq suffered because its brothers failed to back it over these past years. My point is that at first, most of Iraq's Arab neighbors were, like the Saudis, 
deeply concerned about Iraq's Shia ascendance. But these other Arab leaders exhibited a greater willingness to be flexible and to change their minds. As more information became available about what was taking place in Iraq, they dispelled their misconceptions about it and began to engage, rec recognizing correctly that their lack of engagement was in fact counterproductive. Moreover, many of these leaders also privately encouraged Abdullah of Saudi Arabia to reconsider his decision not to engage. But they were no more successful than the Iraqis or the Americans had been in that respect. My point is that in this case study, the decision makers who were willing to dispel their misconceptions pursued a more constructive policy than the ones who were not willing to dispel their misconceptions. This is, I admit, a fairly basic point, but perhaps the story can serve as a lesson of what can happen when leaders are not willing to keep an open mind. So those are my three main points. Iraq's post-2003 alignment with Iran was not a foregone conclusion, but re resulted to a large extent from its isolation by the Saudis. Saudi hostility to the new Iraq was an unintended consequence of the Americans' decision to establish democracy in Baghdad. And basically that open-mindedness and flexibility tend to lead to better policy-making outcomes than closed-mindedness and rigidity. The story I tell in the book basically comes to an end by 2015 with the ouster of Nur al-Maliki and the death of King Abdullah. In the years since then, the Saudis have changed course and have begun to engage with Iraq. That the Saudis decided to change course should not be a surprise. Not only had the Americans, the Iraqis, and other Arab leaders encouraged Abdullah to reconsider his decision, but even Abdullah's own senior foreign policy advisors, figures such as the late Foreign Minister Saud al-Faisal, were of the opinion that the, that, the, that the decision not to engage was counterproductive. With Abdullah's passing, the Saudis had the opportunity to implement a new policy. Thus, a few months after Abdullah's death, the Saudis appointed an ambassador, and the following year they reopened their embassy. In 2017, the two countries established a coordination council to manage the relationship. And in the last year or two, there have been some notable developments. In 2020, the two countries reopened their border, which had been closed for 30 years. Last spring, the Saudis announced an intention to make significant investments in Iraq, and Prime Minister Mustafa al qadani also began a, a mediation effort between Saudi Arabia and Iran. There's no doubt that the Saudis would like to see al qadani given a second term as Iraqi Prime Minister. They see him as an Iraqi nationalist, and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was able to build a personal relationship with him while he was director of Iraq's intelligence service. Today, the Saudis are seeking to build a relationship with Iraq as a way of sort of wooing it away from Iran. That said, serious obstacles remain. Iraq, after decades of war, needs investment, but its endemic corruption seriously complicates the Saudis' ability to actually make investments there. The Saudis' ongoing concerns about Iranian influence also diminishes their interest in actually making investments. Their fear is that the money they put into Iraq could ultimately redound to the benefit of groups aligned with Iran. Moreover, al qadami whom the Saudis like, may very well not receive a second term, which could give them pause. And even if al qadami does get a second term, the Saudis will ultimately be very disappointed if he remains unable to curtail the power of the Iranian-backed PMS. 
These are all factors that could inhibit the development of Saudi-Iraq relations in the years ahead. Even though the Saudi-Iraq relationship has come a long way since the Abdullah and Maliki period, it still has a long way to go, and there's no guarantee that the rapprochement will continue. Nevertheless, one thing is certain. Whereas once the Saudis refused to engage with Iraq, today they recognize that they need to engage, and they are doing so. Thank you. I welcome your questions. Super. Thank you very much. And you have very much wet our appetite to, to read more in the book, uh, available in all good bookshops, <laughs> some bad ones as well, and at the back there. Okay, anybody got any questions for Kitty about uh, her presentation at all? If not, I'm going to uh, I'm going to take advantage uh, of the situation. Um, I mean, from the um, the uh, the explanation that you provided, a lot seems to rest on King Abdullah's yeah. uh, attitude. Um, I mean, does that? What were the main failings within the sort of Saudi foreign policy decision-making process? Yeah. Is it that it's centralized on him, or was he getting bad information, or a bit of both? Or? Yeah, no, I mean, so as I, so my research, as you can all probably tell, was very empirically driven. Um, and as I really began my interviews, uh, which I did with Iraqis and Saudis and also a bunch of Americans and Brits, you know, Generally speaking, I was talking to diplomats who hadn't engaged with the Saudis and but also, I mean, personally engaged with um, Abdullah. Um, and I was very lucky that I was able to talk to a lot of people who had actually, you know, personally talked to Abdullah and personally talked to Saud al-Faisal and, and such. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and what I kept finding from, you know, a wider, really from all my sources, they really all said the same thing, was that the stumbling block, the obstacle, was Abdullah, that he just wouldn't do it. Um, and and uh, Abdullah's rationale, and this is explored in the book, is that uh, actually, Mal I, as I say, Maliki's first trip abroad to Saudi, was to Saudi Arabia, um, and Maliki did in fact meet with Abdullah in, on that trip to Saudi Arabia in July 2006. And that um, shortly, I think from my research, I think the, the meeting went fine. Um, and, uh, but soon thereafter, and this is all explored in the book, Abdullah came to the conclusion that Maliki had lied to him. And Abdullah said, you know, Maliki has lied to me. Uh, he made me promises he didn't keep. Therefore, he's untrustworthy. And oh, by the way, he's also an Iranian agent, and I'm not going to deal with him because he's a liar. Long story sh very short, um, I think that Abdullah genuinely believed that Maliki had lied to him, but I don't actually think that Maliki made him any promises or had in fact lied. It, it, it's, it's a very, um, the, the book is really all about misperception, and I think that Abdullah genuinely believed that Maliki was a liar, but I think that that was also part of kind of this misperception. But so anybody who came to Abdullah, um, you know, got the response from him, Maliki's a liar. Um, and also Americans, you know, specifically American officials who went to Abdullah um, and said, oh, you know, will you engage? He would, al he would also add, you know, I told you what could go wrong in Iraq, and you didn't listen. Um, and to be fair to Abdullah, that was true. <laughs> but you know, so he told the Americans, um, you know, you didn't listen to me, so it's done. I'm not. I'm not going to talk to you anymore on this topic. Um, but the the prevailing view in the literature on Saudi foreign policy or kind of Saudi decision making in the pre MBS pre Salman era. Um, uh, there are a couple of, of different views about Saudi decision making, but sort of the prevailing view is that the Saudis made uh, decisions by consensus, by the, the, the consensus of the senior members of the Saudi royal family, um, the senior princes. And so what I was finding empirically, that Abdullah really just totally dominated this decision, 
was actually was at odds with what the literature says about Saudi decision making. Now, first of all, you know, researching Saudi decision making is exceedingly difficult, it, particularly prior to you know in this kind of pre Salman era. The Saudis uh, now it's today at the present day. It's pretty clear that MBS makes the decisions, um, but. Uh, in this um, earlier period, I mean, for many, I mean, for decades, um, the Saudis um, projected this kind of image of consensus, and that was sort of the prevailing view in the literature. And what I found empirically was that, I mean, there was no consensus um, that you know Abdullah made the decision, and that was it. And so I also had to kind of, and so that's also explored in the book because I had to, um, you know, reconcile that with with the literature, you know, this being a PhD thesis <laughs> originally. And I, um, and what I argue at the very least is, you know, I only explore one decision, but with regard to that one decision, it portrays Abdullah as what you know, in the literature, the foreign policy decision-making literature, what would be called a predominant leader, somebody who, um, you know, a leader who's able to make the decision himself or herself. Um, and stifle dissent. Um, and so I present this as a case study that is um, sort of at odds, that, that, that diverges from that prevailing view of consensus. And actually I show that kind of throughout the whole period of time that I look at, which is really from the 1970s through Abdullah's death, that actually, um, you know, there have been times that there has been a predominant leader, like in this case. There have been times where you know, there are indications that decisions were made by consensus. There were times um, where there was, you know, intense rivalry within the, with the, at the, at the, at the uh, upper echelons of the royal family. And so decision making become, became sort of, um, you know, a function of that rivalry. And, you know, so the point being that, you know, Saudi Arabia it exhibits low, in, it, it does not ex exhibit strong institutions. And so decision making is really a function of, um, the personalities that exist at the top of, of the hierarchy. That kind of goes part way to a, a sort of answering my, my follow up question. I'm fully mindful of the difficulties of, of uh, finding out about the decision making process in Saudi Arabia. Do you get a sense that lessons have been learned about uh, from this particular episode about how decisions are made and perhaps to try and get a bit more consensus? in the system a bit, a bit more challenge no i don't. and actually in to just add an addendum to my last um answer you know the actually the, the saudis that i spoke to um who were i was not many but i was very fortunate to talk to a couple of insiders ro royal family insiders who actually a, a few of them spoke to me pretty candidly and they told me what was in line with what I found elsewhere, that, you know, once Abdullah was king, nobody would, um, you know, he, he had the right, he had the prerogative to make the decision, nobody would um, tell him otherwise. And I, I bring that up because I think that remains the case, um, that, um, that, no, I don't, I don't think, unfortunately, the lessons have been learned, that um, the person who's, and it, the predominant leader, so to speak, and I would argue that today, King Salman is that predominant leader, but he has, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, he has delegated that authority of being a predominant leader to his son, Mohammed bin Salman. And I don't see any indication that um, there's sort of more awareness of, um, you know, there was a lot of, I, and I discussed this in the book, there's, there was ultimately a lot of groupthink. Um, which, I mean, there's a lot of group things just in general in the world, but in a system where everything is, revolves around, you know, one decision maker, and there's really no incentive to disagree with that decision maker, it really does kind of naturally lead to a conformity of views. And um, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't see that there's been an evolution away from, from, from that under the present leadership in Saudi Arabia. I have a sort of a more practical question because we were discussing, we were talking at the start about some of the difficulties of undertaking research 
in the region. How did you find gaining access to, to some of the people that you interviewed? Yeah. Was, it, was it relatively straightforward? Well, so the Iraqis were really easy. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the Iraqis were happy to talk to me, happy to tell their stories. Um, so the Iraqis were easy. Um, I, I actually started my interviews um, with the Americans. And I had, I now live in Washington, D.C., but I had done my master's degree in Washington, D.C. And through various kind of connections, or, you know, I had a couple of contacts who were well-placed diplomatic sources. So that's kind of where I started. And that's why I, people who I knew had spent time in Saudi Arabia and had had these very senior level conversations. And that's why, um, you know, I had, I was a little naive at, at the time as maybe all PhD students are <laughs> when they start out. But that's why I had some thought that I'd be able to do this. And I found that the Americans were also very willing to talk to me. And I was in a happy situation where the officials and diplomats who had been sort of at the top of their career in the 2000s, prior to uh, the Arab Spring, you know, in the years between 2003 and 2010, um, the, peop the people who had been at the top of their careers, when I was looking to interview them 10 years later, were all retired and were happy to, <laughs> were, you know, had the time, or at least had more time, and were happy to tell their stories to a PhD student who was very ha willing to listen to them. You know, they may, might not have um, uh, been willing to speak for attribution, but they were, they were willing, generally speaking, to speak. And that was the same with the British diplomats that I, that I spoke to, too. So the Americans, the Brits, the Iraqis were all easy. What was hard were, were the Saudis. <laughs> and that was really hard. Um, and, um, and I certainly speak to fewer Saudis. I spoke to a lot of people, and, but fewer Saudis. But fortunately, I spoke to a couple who, I've, I mean, it's sort of like the stars aligning. And actually, I sort of mentioned as we were talking, um, in 2008, I was back in... D.C., and I remain eternally grateful to Jamal Khashoggi um, because he was sort of my break. I was in D.C. In, um, in 2018, and I was looking for Saudi sources because I needed Saudi sources, and he had just come to D.C. Uh, he had just you know, fled, left Saudi Arabia, and he had a house in Northern Virginia, so he had come to D.C. Um, and uh, and, you know, as I was kind of reaching out to people, everybody was like, oh, you should talk to Khashoggi. He's in, he's in D.C. now. Um, and D.C. is such a small place. And so it was easy to reach out to him. And he and we got together. We got together at Le Pen Quotidien at, at Union Station, the train station in D.C. Um, and then we got together a second time subsequently. So this was spring and summer um, of 2018. And through him, I was able to connect with a couple of just – really well-placed insiders who spoke to me really candidly. It was just, again, sort of the stars aligning. And actually, those conversations didn't actually happen in Saudi Arabia. They actually happened uh, in London. <laughs> and actually, I found that London, I spoke to a lot of Iraqis in London, too. And, and I was living here while I was doing my PhD from the, for the most part. And um, I found, because I was, again, looking, really interviewing elites, they all came through London, so this was a great place to do research, you know. And uh, so the Saudis were a lot harder, but through just sort of luck um, and some ingenuity, I was able to speak to um, some well-placed uh, Saudi insiders. That said, I wouldn't really recommend to any PhD as a PhD student, you kind of want to pick a topic that you can do that's like sort of low stakes. <laughs> and in, in, in retrospect, this was a little like, you know, I, I was pretty lucky that I got to the people that I got to. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend to a PhD student to do a Saudi foreign policy decision as a research topic. <laughs> well, we're glad that it worked out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, could you say, I mean, a bit more about the, I mean, the, the, the sort of, self-fulfilling prophecy aspects of it. So the way in which the uh, sort of Maliki and the Iraqi government, I mean, why did they, why did they end up sort of turning more towards Iran yeah. than they originally wanted? Was it, 
out of necessity, were practical considerations, even if other Arab states like Jordan, which, yeah. you, which you mentioned, yeah. were perhaps more open to their yeah. overtures. What, what were the what were the push factors? Yeah. So I, I two things, um, and so yeah, by kind of two thousand eight. So 2008 was kind of a good time in Iraq um, because it was after the sectarian civil war. Things were stabilizing. It was before the Arab Spring. Things kind of got derailed again, oddly, of course, in the aftermath um, in Maliki's second government, which, which coincided you know, with the start of the Arab Spring. Um, and by 2008, things were stabilizing. And a lot of Arab states began to engage. Quite frankly, you know, there are a lot of things that I don't exactly have like the hard evidence for, but I sort of suspect based on my research. And I think by about that period, 2008, when all these other Arab leaders started coming to Baghdad, I think they basically decided to break ranks with Saudi Arabia. Um, that's sort of, actually I spoke to one Lebanese politician who was close to the Saudis who, were like, who admitted that you know, they got pushed back from the Saudis, you know, um, and, um, but uh, in the intensely polarized environment um, after the Arab Spring, and the 2010 elections in Iraq was an intensely also polarizing um, period just prior to the Arab Spring, um, and I, there's a whole chapter on the 2010 elections in this book, um, but I think again. I don't. I, I don't have the hard evidence. But you know, whereas states like Jordan, UAE, etc., had sort of broken ranks with the Saudis in this intensely polarized environment. You know, I think that the, the, the these other Arab states, you know, made a decision that yeah, you know, Saudi Arabia is ultimately much. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia is ultimately much more important than our relationship with with Iraq. You know, we. We can only break ranks to, to to such an extent, you know. We're not going to, um, and uh, but for the Iraqis, I think too. I mean, at least from the Iraqis that I spoke to, um, you know, some of whom again were sort of high level and were you know kind of reaching out. I think they they were actually kind of surprised um, that they weren't expecting the Saudis to be so standoffish. Um, you know, I think that this was a surprise to them. Um, you know, they weren't, you know, and they weren't, you know, I mean, Saudi Arabia wasn't their best friend, and they recognized that, you know, the play of the Shia in Saudi Arabia was not good, but, you know, it was just obvious that Saudi Arabia is your southern neighbor. You want a good relationship with your southern neighbor. And so I think that they were actually fairly surprised that the Saudis were so standoffish. And then this became, it became clear that this was a much larger issue. But, you know, in terms of the self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, Iraq, the Maliki government, Maliki personally, gravitating towards Iran. I think that there were two things, and you sort of touched upon it in your question. You know, on a basic level, um, you know, Saudi Arabia was the gateway for the Iraqis back into the Arab world. And, you know, this, you know, by virtue of the fact that they were intent on isolating, that they weren't going to normalize relations with Iraq, there was only so far that the other Arab states were willing to go. And so this cut off Iraq's access to the Arab world. And they only became more dependent um, on Iran. As you know, some actual sources, sources of mine in my interview in, said, you know, it, at, at a certain point, Maliki, the Maliki government only had one friend in the region, and that was Iran. You know, there was only, you know, one neighbor who kind of showed up. Um, and that was Iran. So that was, you know, um, if you never show up, then, you know, it, it's not a surprise that Iran's going to have um, overwhelming evidence, uh, overwhelming influence. But in addition, and this is ultimately the more important point, I think, is that um, the, the Iraqis really, you know, Maliki, other members of this government, but, you know, many members of the Iraqi Shia population and other communities in Iraq, you know, writ large, really came to feel very threatened by the Saudis. I mean, it's a widespread perception in Iraq, and I'm not saying that it's correct, that Saudi Arabia, you know, backed ISIS. Um, and, you know, the point being is that, you know, they, 
the, there are not a number of people, you know, ordinary people, but also members of the government who, you know, felt deeply besieged and felt, you know, threatened. And whether or not, yeah, and whether or not um, their their perceptions were correct or not. And again, this this book is all about perceptions. Um, the you know whether or not their perceptions were correct. The you know Abdullah, the Saudis had laid the foundation for those perceptions because they had only projected hostility, um, and um, and in the uh, and in the environment of the Arab Spring and really the um, civil war in Syria, you know, it became a very established view in Iraq that you know the Saudis and others were looking not only to overthrow Assad in Damascus, but also Maliki in Baghdad, with the point being to sort of reverse the post-2003 order. And I argue that that's really what pushed, that you know, in, in that environment, Iran became a, a protector. Um, you know, it wasn't that Maliki was like, oh yes, Iran's now my best friend. I've been sort of trying to, um, is, you know, maintain my distance, my, my independence from Iran for low these many years, and now I've just dis discovered that they're my best friend. It's no, it's that in that Iran became the protector. In, in what way, sort of economic investments? Uh, I mean, ultimately, yeah. I mean, ultimately, again, going to perception. If if there was a widespread, um, uh, well, so you know, if if there was a widespread belief that you know the Saudis were backing ISIS, well, Iran. Were, were the one in you know the Americans as well ultimately, but but Iran was literally the protector um, you know against ISIS, and um, and uh, any even before 2014 and the takeover of Mosul, um, and again I'm not saying that Saudi Arabia did back ISIS, um, but actually um, uh, you know if the view was that um, if the view was that the Saudis and others, Qatar, um, were looking to overthrow Assad in, in Damascus and Maliki in Baghdad. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the Maliki government had every incentive to, um, to, ass to make sure that the Assad regime remained in place, to, to assist the Iranians in defending Assad. Because the view was that if Assad falls, we'll be next. Um, and so, you know, that, and, 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 the, and the Maliki government, and they didn't like Assad because Assad, you know, in the post-2003 period, um, had facilitated the insurgency in Iraq. So it's not like the Iraqis, you know, Iraqi leaders had any love for Assad. It just became that in this environment, if Assad falls, like, you know, Assad, if Assad falls, we're next. And so we need to do everything that we can to help the Iranians help the regime in Damascus. Um, and I don't, and I think that was a function, again, of the perceptions that they had of Saudi Arabia. And, you know, and I will say, and this is kind of, like, I, um, even though, you know, I'm not going to say that, you know, the Saudis backed ISIS, like, you know, I, um, you know, I discuss in the book that, you know, I think that I have enough evidence to certainly say that Abdullah wanted Maliki removed, you know, um, that Mal that Abdullah was taking steps to replace Maliki. Um, so I, so Abdullah did want Maliki gone. We've got a question here, and then another one from the take up time. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you mean of states like Jordan, for instance? You know, I think that, um, I think fundamentally, um, and uh, Jordan and other states, UAE, I mean, all of them, yeah, they never, I mean, they would have preferred, probably, I'm sure even today, that the U.S. had not invaded Iraq, that the U.S. had not, you know, um, over, you know, they had no love for Saddam Hussein. But you know, I'm sure that all of them would have preferred for um, a Sunni Arab to remain in power in Iraq. You know, I'm sure all of them would have preferred for a Sunni Arab autocrat, you know, not for you know, um, you know, to have remained in power in Iraq. But fundamentally, I mean, the Bush administration wasn't changing. You know, Bush it became a whole rationale. We can that's a whole that's a different topic. That's um, you know, a rationale for the U.S. invasion was to establish democracy in Baghdad, and the Bush administration was not veering from that. And so, um, and this goes to kind of the flexibility and adaptability that I talk about, Abdullah of Jordan, you know, and, and the UAE and all of them, I'm sure they would have really have preferred, it would have been much easier for them if, um, if Bush et al. had just left the Sunni Arab autocrat in place. But that wasn't going to happen. And they recognized, you know, this is happened. Like, we can't go back. Um, you know, we've got to adapt. Um, we've, and, and over time, in, in those first couple of years, I think they realized, and it wasn't like they loved Maliki, loved the people who came to power, but they, I think they recognized over time, we can deal with these people. These, these are not the like Iranian puppets that we thought they were. This is not the Iranian fifth column that we that we initially thought. We we can deal with these people. We can deal with Maliki. We can deal with other members of his government. We can deal with this new reality. Um, and in fact, you know, we only, um, you know, by talking about things like the Shia Crescent, we're only in fact alienating Iraq. We're only doing ourselves a disservice. Um, and fundamentally. Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, he was really the only leader, um, at least of his magnitude, of his weight in the region, who didn't adapt. Um, and I think, you know, I talk about these beliefs, um, you know, about Iran, about the Arab Shia, you know, these stereotypes, um, which I think fundamentally colored his and other Saudi leaders' views. But I think, in addition, um, you know, we can, uh, so I talk a lot about perception and how, you know, we're, sub we're subjective, how we form our perceptions. Um, you know, we have beliefs about the world. They, our beliefs are resistant to change. Um, we form beliefs and we kind of stick to them, but we're not the prisoners of our beliefs. You know, our, our beliefs can change as new information becomes available. But fundamentally, we have to be willing to change our beliefs beliefs. We have to be willing to change our minds. If we're not willing to change our mind, then we're not going to change our mind. Um, the, uh, you know, we'll, we'll cling to, you know, and grievance is really the situation where, you know, you, um, you know, aren't willing to change your belief. And I think that in addition to the stereotypes of, of the Arab Shia in Iran, you know, I think for Abdullah personally, he felt very deeply aggrieved toward the United States. Um, and and again, to be fair to him, I think that he had every reason to feel deeply aggrieved. But that grievance um, uh, meant that he was just totally inflexible and not willing to change. I think he really held out hope or held out the, the belief that, that, he, that things could go back to the way that they were. 
Um, in addition, I talk about Jordan. I mean, Jordan was this remarkable, like, flip-flop. But Jordan, I mean, just had an overwhelming economic necessity to maintain a relationship with Iraq. And so when you have an overwhelming economic necessity, it is very easy. It's much easier to change your mind <laughs> because you have every incentive to change your mind. For Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, there was no economic. Well, I mean, there were, there were opportunities, um, economic opportunities, but there's no there's no like economic imperative as there was for for Jordan. So it was also that deep grievance that really um, helps explain why Abdullah just wasn't going to change. You know, I think. Yeah, yeah, and you're you're absolutely right that the uh, that the Iranians are just are absolutely far better at using proxies than the Saudis are. Um, so uh, I so I don't, for instance, explore like the, the creation of the Mahasasa system and such, but I do in detail look at what was happening right after the invasion, and I do talk about sort of the um, the insurgencies that developed and what was going on, um, and. Uh, <laughs> I've some. It was a really complicated period in Iraq. I mean, not that like there's any period that isn't complicated in, in Iraq, but I really had to grapple with what was going on, <laughs> and um, and I was really trying. I was myself trying to grapple with, but you know, Iran, you know, absolutely from from the get go was establishing its influence in Iraq. I absolutely talk about that, um, and so the Saudi view was always that you know the Saudi view is that as today, it was back then, and even prior to 2003, that, you know, the Iran, that Iran wants to assert regional hegemony. And Iran want, you know, as a, you know, since the time of the revolution, since the time of the Iran-Iraq war, like Iran wants to take over Iraq. Um, so the Saudis view of Iranian t intentions is very maximalist. And so, I was really grappling with well, what were the Iran? What was Iran's intention? What were Iranian intentions with regard to Iraq? Um, and what were they doing? And what I present in the book is that 
you know, the Iranians were absolutely operating in this gray zone. And as you say, they, they, they're good um, at operating in this gray zone. Um, and, uh, or at least they, they kept their options open and they were pursuing opportunities. And, um, and I say that it's really hard even today to know exactly what they were doing and what their intentions were. You know, a lot of kind of analysts, I'm thinking for instance, like the International Crisis Group and other sort of like outside observers were, um, you know, the Saudis were saying, you know, Iran's trying to take over Iraq. You know, other sort of more neutral parties were saying that, you know, Iran is looking to establish, yeah, they're aiding armed groups, they're providing arms to militias, really because they want the Americans to leave. <laughs> um, they're aiding, an anti, you know, anti-U.S. insurgency. But, you know, primarily Iran is looking to take over, is, is, to, is looking to establish a, a, a friendly relationship with the new Iraq, fundamentally so that Iraq doesn't um, threaten it um, as Saddam Hussein's Iraq had. You know, they, they want um, Iraq to be their friend. Um, but I had this sort of epiphany at what, and I was really grappling with this. It's like, well, what were Iranian intentions? Um, and I had this epiphany one day, and it was such a relief. And I, I kind of realized, I don't need to answer the question of what Iran's intentions were. I discuss Iranian intentions. I discuss how it was ambiguous. I discuss how they were, you know, trying to exploit the ambiguity in Iraq, that they were absolutely establishing a presence, um, though it didn't rise to um, the level of what the Saudis kind of thought they were doing. But the point is, is that I'm looking at Iraqi intentions, um, the intentions of, of, you know, Iraqi leaders. And Iraqi intentions, I argue, based on my research, um, you know, and I should say, you know, the intentions of members of the Maliki government, because of course there are lots of Iraqis, um, but Iraqi intentions were to reintegrate into the Arab world, not to have a negative relationship with Iran, but to simultaneously build a positive relationship with Iran and a positive relationship with Saudi Arabia. In fact, a positive relationship with all their neighbors. Um, and so Iraqi intentions were to, you know, to create these balanced regional relations and not to be, you know, just an, and, and, and to have a positive relationship with Iran, but still to maintain some distance from Iran. And you do that by, you know, creating this Arab counterweight, so to speak, and diplomatic speak. Um, so yeah, it was a huge relief to me <laughs> when I realized one day, I don't need, and I say it explicitly in the book, it's not the purpose of my research to kind of, to, um, to answer the question of what was Iran seeking to do. The point is that Iraqi intentions were to invade, it were to reintegrate into the region. And that's what fundamentally the Arab, the Saudis kept missing, I, I think, um, that the Saudis kept seeing, you know, in being so focused on Iran, in being so intensely focused on Iran, they completely um, failed to consider what were Iraqi intentions. Again, and just assuming that Maliki and others were Iranian agents, they deprived, you know, they stripped Maliki and other Iraqi leaders of any, of any intentions, you know. They only focused on what Iranian intentions were. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. 
And so actually, so what I would say is that um, you're absolutely correct that, um, and it, it was fascinating actually to me. <laughs> I hope it's interesting to, to you all that, um, again, prior to 2003, you know, and in, in the, um, you know, Saudi Arabia, you know, we think of Saudi Arabia today as, you know, the kind of leading Arab state. But, you know, if you go back to the 70s and before, you know, Saudi Arabia really was sort of a, a second tier country in the Arab world. Um, and within the Gulf region in particular, you know, Saudi Arabia was the, um, you know, Iran and Iraq were absolutely were absolutely more powerful. Iran was number one, Iraq was number two, and Saudi Arabia was sort of a distant three. Um, and Saudi policy, you know, Saudi Arabia felt threatened by both Iran and Iraq. And even during the Iran-Iraq war, Iran was absolutely the more threatening to the Saudis in their in their eyes. And even though they sided with Iraq and gave you know, Iraq, you know, tremendous assistance during the war. They still felt threatened by by Saddam and by Iraq, um, and uh, and of course, then in 1990, um, Iraq invaded Ar Kuwait, which you know, um, then you know, Saddam Hussein was persona non grata uh, for the Saudis. But the premise of Saudi policy through the 20th century, and something that Abdullah was sort of very keyed into. Um, in his generation, um, was, all right, if Saudi Arabia is sort of the third power, you know, you balance Iran and Iraq against each other. And that means that they're both sort of u these unitary states that, um, uh, it, you know, they're both more powerful than Saudi Arabia, but you, you know, as one becomes more threatening, you gravitate to the other. As that one becomes, you know, you gravitate the, but so you fundamentally you, you balance one against the other. And so I think that's what Abdullah was, you know, when after 2003, he was then, well, you know, there's, you can't balance a Shia-led Iraq against Iran. You know, the, the Shia-led Iraq is just an extension of Iran. The, the U.S. has just completely upset the balance. And so I think that Abdullah was trying to reestablish, you know, an Iraq. So, you know, the, um, he, he, he didn't want Iraq to be, um, I mean, he didn't want Iraq that was going to threaten Saudi Arabia, so he didn't want it to be, you know, too powerful. That wasn't the issue post-2003. He wanted an Iraq that had sufficient weight but was sufficiently anti-Iran sort of by its nature that he could feel um, uh, that it would balance and be sort of that bulwark against Iran. Um, that's, I'm, I'm sort of channeling Abdullah, but based on my research, I think that's what he was, that was traditionally Saudi policy in the Gulf. And I think that that's what he was, um, you know, trying to um, achieve, to, 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 to recreate that situation. And the Saudis today, you know, I think that the Saudis today, you know, have realized, okay, the, a Shia-led Iraq is not just lost to Iran. But, you know, I think ultimately, the, actually, the if you, and this is speculation on my part, but I think that they are engaging with Iraq, which is great, but I think that they would ultimately like to see an Iraq, even if Shia led, that sort of joins them in an Arab coalition against Iran. And Iraq, and that, that's never gonna be something that Iraq, a Shia led Iraq does, I don't, I don't think. Um, but um, I sort of veered on from your question, but that's, that, that's how I would ask, answer your question. Thank you very much. Mindful that we've we've had you on the spot for an hour and a half. Oh my! Um, and, and that the drinks have arrived. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we might call time on the formal formal part of, of this evening and um, uh, and move to uh, to the refreshments <laughs> and to uh, and to having a look at the book. Uh, please join me in thanking Kitty again for her presentation. And please buy the book. <laughs> yes, yes. Please buy the book uh, and please help yourself to a glass yeah. of something nice. <laughs>